Glory to Jesus Christ. Slave Jesus Christo. Good evening and uh, welcome to our live stream, our St. Nicholas of Myra adult class. Uh, I'm going to put in here, as I usually do, <clears throat> my email address for anybody who might be joining us for the first time. Welcome to contact me. Okay, we're going to start here in just a minute. We'll begin by offering a prayer from the Come to Be Prayer Book, and then we will go into uh, the preface and introduction on Mother Maria Skoptsova uh, by Jim Forrest, by Jim Forrest. We had a beautiful in-person class just before this with a couple of a couple of adults, and it was a beautiful discussion that went all kinds of ways. You never know where a discussion is going to go sometimes, uh, but a lot of highlights from the book, from the reading, and uh, looking forward to the next two chapters uh, when we read them this week, but we'll start with the preface and the introduction. Okay, so we will begin by reading a prayer before beginning any task from the Come to Me Prayer Book. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son of your eternal Father, you have said with your most pure lips without me, you can do nothing. My Lord, with faith I hold in my heart and soul these words spoken by you. Help us to complete this undertaking for the glory of your holy name, for you are a good God who loves mankind. And we give glory to you, to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory be forever. Slava Jesus Christus. Slava Naviki. Good evening. And uh, I'll sweat in my eye. Good evening. And I hope that it was a good reading by anybody who participated. If you're joining us for the first time, you are uh, welcome to uh, get this book. Uh, Mother Maria Skoptsova, Essential Writings by Jim Forrest. Pretty easy to get online. You could get it on Amazon. Uh, a lot of different ways that you could get it. Now, the preface to this book was put together by Susan Perry. Uh, this book itself, if you read the uh, copyright page, you find out that it was done in French before it was uh, put together in English. It was released in English in 2003. And it was actually shortly after that, in 2004, that Mother Maria uh, was canonized formally by the Orthodox Church. And uh, so when she writes the preface, she writes as though she is not yet, uh, she is not yet recognized as a saint. So, uh, and, and you'll get parts of that in this book. That's why it was, it was released it was put up, put together in French and then released in English before she was formally canonized by the Orthodox Church in 2004. So there's there are some parts that stand out for me that I want to draw attention to in the readings uh, about Mother Maria, the reflection in the preface and the uh, and the actual content of the introduction. In the preface, there is a certain line that I think captures uh, what Mother Maria, it seems, was trying to capture in her life uh, that I think uh, Susan said very well. On page nine, she says, <clears throat> she says that towards the bottom, the second to last paragraph, she says, humility, freedom, and the wild spontaneity of love that refuses any form of hypocrisy. These are the trademarks of the foolishness of Christ. In 16th century Russia, these fools often had a prophetic message and intervened without hesitation in political or civic affairs. Mother Maria consciously placed herself well within this tradition. That becoming wholly dedicated to love of the neighbor 
and this is what she what we're getting from here is that this is what she gave herself over to completely the love of of neighbor drawing attention to the gospel of matthew where in the our image of the judgment christ says what will we will be asked whether we gave food to the hungry drink to the thirsty uh, clothed the naked healed the sick visited the imprisoned um these very personal things that we are called to do as christians we see mother maria uh becoming very attached to very connected with uh and you get in her life when we go through the introduction we get that she was born in latvia uh then part of the russian empire that her parents were devout orthodox christians uh, but that she had taken her own journey, which I think is true of many people. Just because somebody is born in orthodoxy doesn't mean they haven't taken a journey in their life. Uh, and I think that's especially true of Mother Maria, especially when you get to the part where she is a revolutionary, that she is going down this path uh, with other revolutionaries who are going to change the world. She's going to change the world. And... Where her father's death seems to lead her to an atheism, as it says in page 14. So she has these, these experiences that interrupt her life, that lead her down certain paths, which again is true of many of us. Uh, and so she falls in, but she falls in love with, as it puts here, she falls in love with certain poets and, and literary figures who, in a way, them and, and her personal interactions and her personal experiences and the way that she chooses to live her life begins to lead her back towards this admiration of the faith. Uh, there is this, there's this part on page 16 where in the very middle it says that she and her friends would talk theology, but just as their political ideas had no connection at all to the lives of ordinary people. Their theology floated far above the actual church. There was much they might have learned, she reflected later in life, from any old beggar woman hard at her Sunday prostrations in church. Um, for many intellectuals, the church was an idea or a set of abstract values, not a community in which one actually lives. So she is living in a world where she, she's living a life uh, in her revolutionary times where uh, there is a, a disconnect, a disconnect with, uh, with faith, with, with Christ and with God. And, and you get this sort of build back for her, at least in the introduction, you get this build back for her that she, uh, not build back, but, but, uh, now, now embracing faith, whereas it was not before. Um, so more than before. And it's, as it says, one door open to another, she found herself drawn toward the faith um, she jettisoned after her father's death. She prayed and read the gospel and the lives of the saints. It seemed to her that the real need of the people was not for revolutionary theories, but for Christ. I think that's powerful, extremely powerful, uh, and explains, it begins to explain a lot more the paths that she would later take, that uh, she sees the real need of the people. Uh, so we get that she is involved with other revolutionaries, but time after time, she is disillusioned with these other revolutionaries who are, there's this one part where it says that they have a love of humanity, but not of uh, the person, right? Whereas she is experiencing the opposite. Uh, she is beginning to fall in love with the individual uh, and, 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 and trying everything she can not to lose that. She even becomes think a mayor of a town uh, where she is uh, protecting people. This is the, one of the things that she devotes herself to is protecting people. So she has been a protector, it seems. And that has that is one of her qualities, uh, the qualities of her humanity and, and her individual life, that she is a protector. And, and the paths that she takes as a protector, as somebody wholly devoted to, uh, to the other person, uh, it's very... It's beautiful to see where she goes, uh, and it is told well, I think. Uh, so you, you have a certain turn that happens when, in her second marriage, she loses her, her daughter. And the death of her daughter 
is is one of the more cited moments of her life where she she was dying for a month for a month she was with her daughter in the hospital and uh, at the end of that month her daughter dies and you get this experience of her and she reflects on it and as she puts it she became she became a mother to all she felt a maternal instinct towards everybody who was coming to her that you uh, know in a way uh, motherhood in one sense died and came alive in another that she became a mother to all from that time on and that was that's one of the more cited turns of mother maria's life that she took many different paths uh, and strayed uh, nonetheless she had this quality about her that, you know, the more that she pursued God, the more that this quality came out in her, that God, in a way, uh, it seems that God uh, magnified the gift that she had uh, of being a protector, of being a mother. And so even though she is Saint Maria of Paris, uh, she is very often just called Mother Maria. Uh, and I think that's a very telling thing that she's often known as Mother Maria of Paris, even though she is called a Saint Maria. She's a saint of the church. There could be no greater title. Uh, we've taken to continue calling her Mother Maria. Uh, and so uh, it's beautiful that she had a particular devotion. On page 24, You we get that she has a particular devotion to saints who were blessed as holy fools. Uh, saint Basil the Blessed, of August 2nd, uh, who, uh, right, that one passed by just recently. And she writes about the holy fools. She says this, she says that freedom calls us contrary to the whole world, contrary not only to the pagans, but to many who style themselves Christians. She's even speaking against people who call themselves Christians, who are, who are to her not, maybe, to undertake the church's work in what is precisely the most difficult way and we will become fools in Christ because we know not only the difficulty of this path, but also the immense happiness of feeling God's hand upon what we do. So now Mother Maria, she, in a sense, makes a conscious decision to become like the holy fools, to experience that measure of freedom. So to be a holy fool, right, is to undertake the work of the church uh, flying in the face of convention conventionality, flying in the face of the way in which things are just supposed to be done, uh, seeing, really going for the absolute end of the line uh, of what it means to love your neighbor, going to the absolute end of that uh, uh, with, with, with abandon with a certain abandon. Uh, she sees a blessedness in the holy fools. And there are many other fools, uh, holy fools that we, we refer to. Uh, St. John of San Francisco, he was no, he was considered a holy fool, uh, somebody who flouted conventionality for the sake of his brother uh, and for the sake of, of love for God. And uh, you have <clears throat> St. Xenia of, of Petersburg, uh, who was considered a fool uh, of the church, St. Simeon the Stelite. There are many others who are called fools uh, for Christ, who did, who seemed to the world to be very foolish in the way that they did things. But uh, we're, doing, we're doing God's will in the most difficult ways, in some of the most difficult jobs and the difficult tasks, uh, but, having, but appearing to be quite foolish in their ways, prophetic, uh, in the way that they spoke, so intimate was their relationship with God. They would say things and do things that just were strange to people around them, but who would, but God's will would somehow work through them. It would just things would be where the way the way they needed to be, and and what was said, what needed to be said would be said with them. These these foolish, foolish seeming people who did silly things, uh, but God's will be, would be done. And so you have Mother Maria admiring these holy fools and so you have her taking on a very unique and free lifestyle with the blessing of the metropolitan of logi uh he he seemed deeply as he puts it as it's put here remained deeply committed to her activities uh even supporting her that she in order to give 
to make sure that everybody had a room, she would sleep on the floor uh, uh, wrapped in blankets. Um, she would not take a room for herself necessarily. She would spend every waking moment with people, every waking moment, and practicing the asceticism of of being with the other person. There's a that it, it even says here that she would um, that she would be with somebody and be completely with that person. That it, what was happening before or after or around didn't matter, and you get testimonies uh, where people as they put it in the book, would be lined out the door wanting to speak with her. She was a mother to them. They would line up for their mother. And so you have other things that paint the picture of her motivation, of the life that she was wholly dedicating herself to. I, I'm particularly fond of the story on page 26 about St. Nicholas of Myra and John Cassian, which is a, a legend uh, about how the two of them have been called to to meet God. And they came upon a peasant, his cart mired in the mud, who begged their help. John Cassian regretfully declined, explaining that he was soon due back in heaven and must keep his robes spotless. Uh, meanwhile, Nicholas was already up to his hips in the mud, freeing the cart. And so the ruler of all discovered why Nicholas was, was covered in mud and John Cassian was immaculate. It was decided that St. Nicholas's feast day would henceforth be celebrated twice each year, uh, while St. John's would occur only once every four years on February 29th. Uh, it's quite, it's an enjoyable little thing, but it paints, again, that picture of the life that Mother Maria is endlessly pursuing. Uh, this attitude that she is endlessly pursuing, this complete preoccupation with love of the neighbor, uh, seeing God in the neighbor, a complete love for the neighbor. Uh, that complete love for the neighbor translates to complete love for God. And, and, and not treating a neighbor as a means to an end, but as, as much as Christ identifies himself with the least of these, the brethren, so much so does she devote herself to that person as Christ himself, not like Christ, but as Christ uh, and that complete love. So you have all of this going on, right, uh, in her life. And uh, she has these these turns and, 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 and pivots that she has in her life, all of which, again, you get you have the same person. And God is seen, God seems to be magnifying and blessing her in her work. But you get and you get these moments of just honesty from her as well. She says uh, on page 26, the third paragraph, she says uh, on one occasion, a visitor found her collapsed in an armchair in a state of exhaustion. She says, I can't go on like this. I can't take anything in. I'm tired. I'm really tired. There have been about 40 people here today, each with their own sorrow and needs. I can't chase them away. So she she is brutally honest. She's very honest about how she's doing. She, even though as a monastic, she has, which usually calls an inward life, she has a very outward life. Uh, and, and in this way, she is quite foolish uh, that uh, she would even leave services you know, as soon as somebody was ringing the doorbell, seeing, uh, seeing ha again, having that preoccupation with the other, with a, with the, with another person, uh, that anybody could be there, and it would frustrate the other mothers uh, to no end. Mother of Dolkia and Mother Blandina, it mentions, who were more traditional in their monastic life, uh, who wouldn't leave services for nothing, right? And so you have them wholly dedicated to services and you have her wholly dedicated to people uh each occupying the same house as it says it was not clear who was in charge all the time and so they would be uh they would come against each other since there was no abbess there there was no one to arbitrate between them uh you get this line from her where she wrote in her journal it says piety piety but where is the love that moves mountains you haven't heard this frustration with uh, this preoccupation with the traditions of the church. This uh, uh, she sees. She, she seems to be doing everything possible to lose uh, the preoccupations. Anything that gets in that she, that gets in the way of love of neighbor. Uh, anything that gets in the way of that, she is done with that. Uh, she she seems to be tired 
of uh, she seems to be tired of those who call themselves Christians, uh, it, it, as it was put in here. Those who call themselves as Christians or, or call themselves as Christians, uh, there seems to be a a frustration, uh, or, or at least a a, a resolve to be other than that. Uh, there's no room for hypocrisy in her life, almost like a hard mother. I can't help but think that almost like a hard mother who has no time uh, because she has her children to care for. She She's in a position where she has no time for hypocrisy. She has no time for getting pushed off. She has no time for uh, getting half truths. She has only time for the whole truth. And she has her uh, she has her children in mind. And so this is the picture that we're getting. I think that I, at least I'm getting about Mother Maria as we're reading about her life. And uh, uh, this week we will get into uh, the, the next two chapters uh, about her, uh, from her writings. And so we get that she has been turning her attention to the community, to refugees. She... Uh, she would do things so as to cover her children. Uh, at least anybody who came to her, she would cover them. There's this story that's told on page 28, where on one occasion, a guest stole money, 25 francs from, I'm assuming from, uh, from the Lorma house, from the Lormel house there. And everyone guessed who the culprit was, guessed uh, who was a drug addict, but mother Maria refused to accuse her. Instead, she announced at the dinner table that the money had not been stolen, only misplaced, and she had found it. And then she said, you see how dangerous it is to make accusations, she commented. And then the girl who stole the money burst into tears. And, and then she says, it is not enough to give, Mother Maria might say, we must have a heart that gives. The only ones who make no mistakes are those who do nothing. She's, she has very very hard sayings that force reflection you'll know I, i've noticed that about her writings i hope you do too that force reflection and that provoke us to consider what we have been doing uh, she's 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 good at this uh, and i can only assume she was good at that in real life and in her own life in her own time i should say and so uh, you have her going to sanitariums and insane asylums uh interceding for people you have her you have her driving concern that the work should never lose its personal or communal character uh the standard model for a soup kitchen uh to come feed and leave uh at least for her was not acceptable uh as she put it, we should make every effort to ensure that each of our initiatives is the common work of all those who stand in need of it, and not simply part of some charitable organization where some perform trips for where some perform charitable actions and are accountable for it to their superiors while others receive the charity. Uh, cultivating instead a communal organization, uh, the concept of conciliarity is sobermost, committing her to this. Uh, this shows up in the next in her writings, Sobernost. And so if that's not a very clear term, uh, it will be made more clear later on as we uh, read the life, uh, as we read the writings of Mother Maria. And, and I think the more powerful and telling paragraph about why she does what she does is on page 30 there, that second paragraph of her writings, where she says, hi, sweetie, where she says, the way to God lies through love of people. At the last judgment, I shall not be asked whether I was successful in my ascetic exercises, nor how many bows and prostrations I made. Instead, I shall be asked, did I feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the sick and the prisoners? That is all I shall be asked about every poor, hungry and imprisoned person. The Savior says, I, I was hungry and thirsty. I was sick and in prison to think that he puts an equal sign between himself and anyone in need. I always knew it but now it has somehow penetrated my sinews. It fills me with awe. And it, it's a very powerful saying that she, has a, she wants to practice a complete love for the other person. Uh, 
go find mommy, sweetie. What? I'll go find mommy. I'll be back soon, okay? Why? Because I'm talking to people. Which guy is talking to people? Well, you'll see. Well, I'll show you the video later, okay? okay. Want to watch it later with me? No. No? Okay. I don't blame you. So, you have Mother Maria. Also coming into contact with other people who are helping her. We, we get introduced to Father Dimitri Klepinin, who was 35 years old, uh, and he proved to be a great helper, a great helper for Mother Maria, and actually ends up getting canonized along with her uh, in the work. Uh, and he gets imprisoned together with her son, Yuri, who uh, her son, Yuri, went with her, to uh, eventually he was in a he was a, in a sanitarium for a while i believe they said and then he would stay with her uh later in life in the, in the late 30s and so but the, uh, when they were taking in jews who were being sought out by the nazis at the time and, and occupied france they were being sought out and they would provide baptismal certificates for them in order to conceal them to hide them to protect them uh, there's this even the stories of her sneaking, well, not sneaking so much as entering into these stadiums where Jews are being gathered up and uh, going into them and rescuing children, hiding them in garbage bins and taking them away. There's actually a book called Silent, uh, Silent as a Stone, I believe it's called. And uh, it's this children's book about this woman, Mother Maria, hiding children in the in the bins and taking them out of the stadium um, before the parents get taken away. Um, and so, and she's counting her blessing that she has that monastic habit that she is able to come and go without question uh, to these different places. Now, you have these stories where Father Dimitri gets basically uh, slapped across the face by authorities at the time. And the danger is growing and she sees God's hand and the fact that she is not getting... Uh, that they they have not been stopped by the Gestapo, by the Gestapo yet. That, that she sees God's hand in in their work. So she's obviously she sees God's hand at work. Uh, that she sees the blessings in the work that she is doing. So, so, and then we get that she gets arrested. They get taken to the camps, and we get guesstimations about what happens. Uh, especially as she is losing her health. Uh, they put it that she miraculously lasts so long uh, that she, you know, she was in her 50s. She was in her 50s, but had, uh, as she put it, become an old woman, uh, even losing the ability to walk at a certain point in these uh, terrible, terrible camps. Uh, you have to read them for yourself and see the pictures for yourself to understand uh, just exactly what people we're subject to, but she sees a, she has a complete identification with with the Jews and all the others who are pers being persecuted. Um, as she puts it, there is no Christian problem. Uh, there is no such thing as a Christian problem. Uh, there is, uh, as she puts it, she put it that if we were Christians, we would all wear the star. We would all wear it. Uh, if if. if powerful very powerful saying uh again that no nonsense that 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 willingness to com identify completely and love the neighbor completely with abandon um to not have time for the uh what do you call it the, the hypocrisy of the world she sees the way the way the world is hypocrisy and so uh she has no time for that as it seems in her life and so as time goes on, uh, we, we get to her death. That is, it's actually just before everybody is rescued. Um, and so we have the end of Mother Maria's life. And uh, the hope is when this book was released to be able to spread this understanding about Mother Maria uh, and to introduce her life to help pave the way towards renewed experiments in religious life as she began in France. Uh, so I hope this has been helpful for you uh, and good uh, nutritional reading for the soul. Uh, I hope that uh, you find the next two readings good. We will meet again next week and we will read chapters one and two. Chapters one and two. Chapter one is the second gospel commandment and 
chapter 2 on the imitation of the mother of God. So that's pages 45 to 74. That's 45 to 74. So chapters 1 and 2 for next week. Thank you all of you for anybody joining us. And uh, may God bless you and keep you this evening. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory be forever. Uh -huh.